Hello, welcome to our webinar today on Gender Impact Assessment and Oxfam's Gender Impact Assessment Guide. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment to make informed decisions. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars offered by IAIA. And I invite you to visit our website and check out the recordings of a few of our recent ones. As you'll see on screen, we've had a variety of topics covered. And these are just a few, emerging technologies, biodiversity, indigenous voices, health, resettlement, uh, and there's many more. So please check out our webinars page. You'll see the link up there. Um, all the recordings and the slides and handouts are available free of charge. Uh, if you would like to share some information or tweet out or social share on what you're learning today, please feel free to do that. You'll see our Twitter handle there is at IAIA Network. And the hashtag that we use for our webinars is IAIA Webinar. Before we jump into our exciting presentation today, I just wanna go through a few items of housekeeping. You'll see on the right side of your screen, a control panel for GoToWebinar. And on the top is an orange arrow, which allows you to minimize or expand your control panel screen in case you wanna get it out of the way. Uh, we are, in fact, recording this webinar, so we will make it available to you afterwards. You will receive a link to it within 48 hours. Are we accepting questions? Absolutely. Uh, today's format's a little bit different than some of the webinars we've done in the past. We're going to have an interview format for about the first 20 minutes. And during this portion, we'll display some slides that describe Oxfam's work on gender impact assessment. After that, we're going to open up the webinar for questions, sharing, and discussions. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to enter them into the questions box in your control panel on the right side of your screen. I will be reading these to the panelists after the interview segment, so please keep them concise and, and clear to help us out a bit so we can get through as many questions as we can. You can also share verbally uh, in this webinar. So if you would like to share an experience or contribute to the discussion after we've finished with the interview portion, you can click the raise a hand button on that control panel. And again, we just ask that you keep your sharing uh, succinct and limited to four minutes each. Ideally, it'd be great if you had some kind of microphone so that we can avoid any background noise so that everybody can hear you. Even a set of earbuds with an incorporated microphone is helpful. And finally, the slides will be available to you. You will receive the link to both the recording and the slides after the webinar ends. Now, let me introduce our Oxfam team. Maria J. Espeleta is the Senior Gender Advisor for Oxfam's Extractive Industries Global Program. In this role, she works with colleagues and partners around the globe to advance gender, just, gender justice and women's rights through research, advocacy, and program design. Prior to joining Oxfam, Maria conducted community-based research focusing on extractive industry projects in the Philippines and in Peru. So Chieta Sim serves as program manager for Oxfam's Mekong Water Governance Program. She oversees staff and manages a portfolio of civil society, river network, youth networks, and partners projects in the lower Mekong Basin. Oxfam's Mekong Regional Water Governance Program envisions a more inclusive, equitable water governance that reduces the impact of climate change and increases the social accountability of citizens in the Salween and Mekong River Basin, or the Greater Mekong. Maria and Societa will be interviewed by Ian Thompson. Ian leads Oxfam Canada's policy work on gender justice in the mining, oil, and gas industries. In collaboration with partners and colleagues in Canada and more than 30 countries, he advocates for public policy reform and changing industry norms to tackle the entrenched gender bias around natural resource extraction. Who benefits, who bears the risk, and who holds power? And with that, I'll turn it over to Maria to get us started. Thanks so much, Bridget, and hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. As Bridget mentioned, my name is Maria, and I work on women's rights in the context of large-scale oil, gas, and mining projects. In case you're not familiar with Oxfam, we are a global NGO 
working in more than 90 countries. Our mission is to end poverty and promote social justice. We take a rights-based approach and underpinning all of our work is a recognition that gender equality is a matter of rights and is essential for reducing poverty. For Oxfam, ending poverty depends on securing women's rights. My colleagues and I are so excited to be here uh, joining you for this webinar. Many thanks to the IAIA and Bridget for putting it together, and especially to Greg Radford, former president of the association, who offered some very helpful advice on the content. Today's session is a great opportunity for us to get a feel for what folks in this community have been doing or thinking about on gender impact assessment, and for us to hear feedback on a tool that we've developed. To get us set up for our conversation, I'm gonna pass the mic to my colleague, Ian. Thanks, Maria. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us online today. Now, as, as Oxfam, we tend to work through partnerships and collaboration. And we're always keen to learn from other people and others' experiences and to share some of the learnings from our own programming. Today's webinar builds on collaborations with the impact assessment community. Oxfam has been engaging with IAIA and its events uh, over a number of years, and we really value this as a community of practice. Based on the poll that uh, many of you filled out during the registration process, it's clear that we have a diverse group of people here on the line today. I expect that if you're participating in this webinar, you're either already fully on board with the idea of integrating gender analysis, or are certainly interested in learning more about how to do it well. And that's why we're deliberately leaving time and space in the second half of the webinar to hear from all of you, uh, to hear your questions, your suggestions, your experiences. I'm really excited to hear what you want to bring to the table and what experiences you've had. So please don't be shy. And as Bridget mentioned, uh, while I'm speaking with Societa and Maria, um, please feel free to type questions into the question box, which we can come to uh, during the open session later in the presentation. For today, we set ourselves two main uh, goals. Uh, first, we'd like to uh, discuss some of the, the tools, the techniques, and approaches for gender impact assessment, including the guides that Oxfam has developed and that we're currently piloting. And secondly, we'd like to identify some of the opportunities for integrating gender analysis into impact assessment. We see many potential benefits of a wider uptake globally and we're really keen to explore what can move gender analysis from being a, a niche endeavor into a widespread norm in impact assessment good practice. Oxfam's global program on extractive industries and our water governance program in the Mekong region have each been operating for close to 20 years. We work with communities who are affected by large scale mining, oil, gas, and water projects. For, for Oxfam, government, governance is really about who is involved, who is excluded, who wins and loses when decisions are being made about the management of natural resources. Most often, we've found that it is the poor, the marginalized, indigenous communities, and especially women who are most negatively impacted by such projects. So our work on natural resource management is rooted in some basic principles that people have a right to decide how natural resources are managed and a right to know about the risks and opportunities of natural resource development through open and transparent processes. If natural resource management is not accessible to all, it leads to inequality and in the worst cases, uh, human rights abuses and corruption. So we're gonna commit, we're, we'll make a commitment to, to you on the, on the webinar today that what we hear today, we will bring back to some of the local civil society partners who are piloting our gender impact assessment tools and to other colleagues throughout the Oxfam Confederation. And we're also hoping that today's conversation will enrich all of you and will continue to percolate in future events of the IAIA. Now uh, let's get started, Maria. Maybe you could begin by telling us what gender impact assessment is from Oxfam's perspective. Yeah, sure, Ian. Thanks. Uh, before diving into what GIA is, I thought it might be helpful just to give a little framing on how Oxfam enters into the space of impact assessments. So as Ian mentioned, in the case of extractive industries, oil, gas, and mining, we've been working with impacted host communities for around 20 years. In that time, we've seen that the impacts of projects are not gender neutral. Impacts are different for women, 
men, girls and boys, and gender diverse groups in local communities. And projects very often have significant effects on gender roles and relationships within the communities as well. So this, of course, isn't very surprising. You would expect that these types of projects would have different effects on individuals, different individuals within communities, with gender one of, if not the strongest determinant of this. But as far as we've seen, assessing and disaggregating these impacts is not necessarily being addressed systematically. We've also seen that for the most part, women are almost always worse off than men in terms of how they experience project impacts. They tend to shoulder more of the negative fallout from social and environmental impacts, while at the same time, they enjoy less of the potential benefits, like jobs and compensation, for example, in the case of mining. One of the main, main reasons for this is the particular roles and responsibilities that women have within households and communities. And of course, differences in access to and control of resources. Um, for example, a simple, a simple idea is about water. In rural areas, women and girls are often in charge of collecting water. If water becomes harder to get to, they need to spend more time and walk longer distances to get to it. This decreases the time that they can spend on other things like uh, income generating activities. In general, we're seeing that large scale projects and related processes have a tendency to reinforce or exacerbate existing gender inequalities and gender gaps, often via a cascade of direct and indirect impacts that materialize over time. Another reason that women may experience a disproportionate amount of neg negative impacts is because women may not be engaged in consultation processes, so their need needs and interests may not be fully accounted for. Understanding these gender differentiated impacts ahead of time and putting in place mitigative measures is becoming more and more of a business imperative. It can be a very critical way to avoid potential company community conflict and gain social license to operate. It's even making its way into legal frameworks. For example, Canada just passed Bill C-69, which requires intersectional gender analysis, which they call gender-based analysis plus, for any projects that trigger a federal impact assessment. GIA is also a great way to identify how we can enhance potential benefits for women and men and diverse groups in local communities. So what is gender impact assessment? GIA identifies the likely impacts a project will have on women, men, boys and girls, and on gender diverse groups and the relationships between them in affected communities. A GIA is process oriented, implemented through close engagement with communities, sustained over time. It can be undertaken at any point in the life cycle of a project from exploration to operation and closure. However, GIA is of course most useful at the early stages so it can help mitigate against undesirable impacts and enhance positive ones. Ideally, a GIA will inform our cost benefit analysis of the project from a socioeconomic perspective, specifically in relation to gender roles and relationships. At Oxfam, we see GIA as having enormous transformative potential. It can give voice to women's and other potentially marginalized people's perspectives, needs, and interests, and can help address power imbalances between companies and communities and within communities themselves. GIA is a community-based exercise that ideally drives assessment from the lived realities of people in communities rather than taking an extractive research approach. We also see GIA as a really great planning tool. It can inform the design of gender responsive company community consultation, particularly by identifying any barriers to participation by women and others in these processes. And along these same lines, it can also inform processes to seek free prior and informed consent when applying in collaboration with indigenous peoples and the representative institutions. A GIA can also guide decision-making around compensation packages and social development projects. It can foster the participation of women and men in project assessment and planning. And very importantly, a GIA can inform resourcing and budget allocation for addressing potential impacts. For example, there may be a need to invest in broader or more consultation, or there may be a need for material changes to the project itself itself because of potential impacts. Thanks, Maria. That's a really good overview of um, Oxfam's understanding of gender impact assessment and, and what's brought us uh, to this point in our work on GIA. Uh, I might turn to you, Sochiata. I know that uh, the Oxfam uh, Water Governance Program in the Mekong region put a special focus on gender from the very start. Maybe you could uh, spend a moment just telling us what motivated the program to bring a gender lens to its work. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Ian. Um, let me begin by saying that um, in the Mekong region, where Oxfam uh, Mekong Regional Water Governance Program have been implementing our work, we have seen that gender remain an issue that need to have a greater consideration, especially in terms of policy and practice changes. Um, we have seen that uh, women and men they have uh, different needs because of their different role in society and in family. Uh, we also know that uh, structural inequalities exist in every society and most often disadvantage women on political, social and economic levels. And where women's needs and rights can often be invisible or ignored, it leads to a gender blind. Um, and I would like to just reference the uh, recommendation from uh, World Commissioning on Dam report, where it states that where planning is uh, insensitive to gender, project impact can at best be neutral and at worst um, aggravate existing gender disparity to the extent of rad radically affect the pre-project gender balance. So for Mekong Water Governance Program, we consider gender inclusion as a good business practice. By doing a gender inclusion in projects, um, it helps identify possible gender impact that can be minimized, the risk and the cost associated with it. And it also allow the a business to maximize the opportunity for a sustainable development. And I think Maria mentioned earlier around getting the uh, social licensing to operate, which means that um, the company can implement gender strategy, gender action plan, and allo allocate the uh, sufficient resource to manage the plan and any unforeseen impact result from the projects. And also we see that it is a, a very good opportunity for uh, projects to empower women within their project area. So um, I think uh, for this uh, session, we would like to share the experience from Mekong Regional Water Governance Program in, in uh, implementing our uh, piloting uh, with our civil society partner. So, um, the inclusion, uh, the inclusive civil society projects, which we work across uh, different country along the Mekong River. We work through uh, national partners to pilot the gender impact assessment tool in hydropower dam site. And I uh, particularly mentioned two uh, countries that we have been implementing this work between 2015 to 2019. That is in uh, Lao PDA and also in uh, Vietnam. So um, in Lao PDA, we partner with Lao Women Union. Uh, Lao Women Union is a mass organization and uh, have the mission to advance women's rights and gender equality in the context of Lao. The piloting of the GIA uh, take place in the uh, Tan Hin Boon uh, Hydropower Dam Sai, Resettlement Sai, which is a downstream community from uh, Nam Tan Tu, which is another dam in Laos. The tools and questions that uh, uh, cover in the GIA were used to interview resettled community in the downstream villages. The other uh, piloting site that we have uh, done this work is uh, in Central Highland in Vietnam. We partner with uh, our local uh, partner, Center for Social Research and Development. Um, and the, the piloting uh, takes place along the Srepok River um, in the dam site called Alus. Stripebox 3, 4, and 4, 4A hydropower area. Uh, let me just mention that during the, the periods that we work with our local partner to pilot this, Oxfam and partner also uh, focus our activity on capacity building to local uh, stakeholders, including the La Women Union uh, provincial staff their provincial researcher about tools, processes, and the uh, analysis framework of uh, gender impact assessment in context of hydropower. We also uh, facilitate uh, exchange and learning between the two partners, bringing their ex experience and um, a reflection on implementing this uh, tool within their own context 
to be shared across um, the partner. I just want to highlight some of the uh, findings through the work that our partner have done. Um, so in terms of uh, using gender impact assessment, it's applied the gender lens in examining the cost and benefit of hydropower induced livelihood changes, as well as the participation in uh, processes such as consultation and decision making related to uh, re re relocation, compensation and livelihood programs. The information that uh, were collected via separate group discussion for men, for women, and also through key informant interview, we have interviewed uh, over 143 respondents in which we give an equal representation to uh, women who took part in this uh, process. Um, some of the findings that uh, confirmed through the uh, impact assessment tool was that across the village, that uh, uh, the research village that we uh, interview um, and gather the information, we see that men play a larger role in decision making processes regarding to compensation and livelihood restoration strategy at the household level. Uh, most of the women that uh, we interview reported that they were consulted during the survey and also were required to co-sign agreement that the, the company with the company in order to confirm uh, acceptance of the land and asset survey uh, through the process. However, some uh, said that they were not as involved in the process and they did not sign. Um, the rapid assessment described the asset survey process conducting in the res reservoir resettle site, which was done according to the principle of equality in land rights. So that is to say, um, the surveyor inquired that uh, both the husband and wife, who is um, the original owner of the land or the asset. Also, um, just to reference that finding from the impact assessment, uh, gender impact assessment in hydropower uh, area in Slapok River, affirmed that gender division of uh, labor, roles, impacts, and demand differ between men and women, making it more difficult for women in economic life, in their physical and their mental health, even in the community where women play a leading role. And we also found that um, gender-based issue are not uh, fully aware by the project developer. So I, I just want to give that highlight from our experience piloting the GIA in, in both countries. Thanks, Sochieta, for that, um, that applied uh, experience. And it, it brings to light for me the fact that some of these gender differentiated impacts um, may not have surfaced through other impact assessment methodologies. Um, and that's something I'd, I'd like to ask you, Maria. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different types of impact assessment out there. What would be the reason for doing a gender impact assessment as opposed to a uh, human rights impact assessment or perhaps integrating gender perspectives into a social impact assessment? What's really the distinction between uh, the GIA and some of these other impact assessments that are conducted? Yeah, great question, Ian. Um, fundamentally, a GIA is based on gender analysis, and this is something we think should be done across any type of impact assessment, whether it's HRIA, SIA, health assessment, etc. Uh, a gender analysis maps gender roles and relationships and the inequality in these relationships. It describes the gender context. It asks who does what, who has what who decides how, who will gain, who will lose, and very importantly, which women, which men, which girls and boys, and gender diverse groups. This last piece is something very important that a gender framing brings, which is the idea of understanding how other aspects of a person's identity, like race, ethnicity, age, physical ability, indigeneity, et cetera, all interplay with gender to determine an individual's experience, in this case, from impacts of projects. Some SAAs tend to view communities as homogenous, not necessarily considering gender differences in roles, rights, needs, and interests, or socioeconomic gender power relationships. 
So typically they end up reflecting a reality based on men's lives. A GIA can therefore help fill any gaps in SIAs, any gender gaps. Yeah. In the case of HRIAs, GIAs are technically distinct from HRIAs in that HRIAs assess the distance between human rights commitments of a state and other actors and human rights in practice, whether and how a project is impacting or putting human rights at risk. Ideally, an HRIA would be grounded in gender impact assessment and then map these findings to human rights risks and opportunities disaggregated by gender to ensure that women's rights are not overlooked. Of course, what comes immediately to mind is this is yet another impact assessment. There's HRIAs, SIAs, and now GIAs. So as with all of these, the verdict is not really in yet on whether GIA should be standalone or integrated. Oxfam developed the guide as a standalone exercise just to isolate the processes that we see as intrinsic to a GIA. But we encourage and we hope to hear ideas about how GIA can integrate into existing processes, not as a single checkbox, but as a really foundational um, piece to other types of assessments. Another unique aspect of GIA is that ideally it not only fosters participatory community engagement, other processes might do this as well, but the exercise itself doing a GIA aims to and can promote gender equality. Last year, I attended the IAIA symposium on mining, and I remember someone posing the question, what is the mining project we want to see? Challenging the IA community to use as a starting point of assessment an aspiration around what would you leave if you had to stop consultation or engagement the next day? The point was that impacts start right away, as soon as a project is approved, and the assessment process in and of itself is also an impact. It affects and can change socioeconomic and political dynamics within communities. So following this logic, GIAs can therefore be a pathway towards gender transformation and for closing power gaps between companies and communities. So GIA really has the potential to hit a lot of the buckets that we want to hit if our aim is to promote IA processes that foster engagement and participation that have the potential to increase transparency and access, for, access to information. And ideally, I think GIAs can be a pathway for building mutual trust between project proponents and local communities. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why Oxfam uh, drafted a guide on how to conduct a gender impact assessment and made it uh, publicly available. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the Oxfam GIA guide, what it looks like, how it would be used, wh when to use it? Uh, yeah, sure. In terms of the genesis of the tool, uh, the guide was developed in response to requests from the private sector from, from companies themselves. Companies were increasingly uh, recognizing the need to understand gender differentiated impacts, and they were asking for some sort of tool or guidance that could help. Uh, so we set out to produce a guide uh, tailored at first for use by companies within the hydropower sector, and you've heard a little bit about the pilots of this version from Sociata. After that, we uh, revised the guide to a tailor it for oil, gas, and mining projects, and now we're starting to pilot this new version in a couple of countries. In terms of the guide itself, it's in narrative written form and has four steps. It also proposes a set of key principles that should underpin the GIA. The first step is collecting basic baseline information around the gender context. This includes gathering gender disaggregated demographic and economic information, poverty levels, etc. And it also maps things like who does what and when in the community, how household and income generating activities are divided between family members according to gender, with an understanding of women's triple roles, that's productive, reproductive, and community-focused work. There's a tool for mapping the gender division of labor, as well as a suggested way to chart access to and control over resources by gender. And these tools are all based on established gender analytical frameworks by uh, the likes of Caroline Moser and other gender and development practitioners. Step two takes this information and begins to de develop an understanding of the likely impacts of a project on different genders. And it probes on some of the institutional and structural causes of gender inequality within communities. Step three is planning. Uh, I remember this being a strong theme at the IAIA mining symposium, the idea that SIA processes should drive project planning. So this is where you develop a gender action plan for mitigating negative impacts and enhancing potential benefits. This is also when you use the data you've collected to inform the design of benefit sharing and compensation agreements, community development plans, community grievance me mechanisms and protocols and so forth. 
Um, it's very important that this plan is made public. Transparency around assessment processes and results is absolutely critical. The report and the gender action plan should be publicly available so that they can be accessed and used to inform decision making. This will help promote greater local ownership, build trust among stakeholders, and hopefully promote greater accountability on the part of project proponents. The last step covers continuous reviewing, monitoring, and improving of the plan, as well as a plan to evaluate performance. Uh, and very notably, doing all of this requires a facilitator with strong community engagement skills, someone with experience in gender analysis, and definitely a commitment to participatory processes. As with all types of participatory processes, safety must be of paramount concern and a risk analysis and mitigation plan, particularly related to women's participation needs to be implemented. If you could just go forward, great, Ian. Um, so here's an example of one of the suggested ways to organize data around access to and control over resources. You'll see it's a very simple chart, and this just shows a slice of a potentially longer list of categories in that first column. And in terms of the groups of people, best practice would be to include a third column on the right side for gender non-conforming or gender diverse individuals. As a complement to the narrative, we developed a mobile application which can be used for step one to collect the baseline information. This app can generate useful reports and can then, that can then be used in the subsequent steps. And I know that people tend to get very excited when there's a fun new piece of technology to use. We've built the app, we started testing it, but we're really moving cautiously with it simply because we're not yet sure of the business model that can sustain it over time and how we can make the app available to a range of stakeholders. Uh, we're not sure yet how we'll disseminate it. Great, thanks, Maria. I think that's a really good overview of the guide and um, and gives a bit of a taste of what some of the, the tools are within it. And I'd encourage everybody on the webinar to please take a closer look at it. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit more to some of those benefits that might come from a, conducting a GIA. And I might turn back to you, Sochiata, just to ask whether um, your organization, your partners that you were working with, did uh, some of the benefits uh, that Maria was describing materialize when you were conducting the GIA? Um, what, what, what was your experience? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um... Uh, Maria has described, uh, so I think just to clarify a little bit that uh, we have uh, two versions of the gender impact assessment. The one that Maria has provided data for steps, those are the gender impact assessment guide for mining sector. Um, for hydropower sector, we have uh, a, a very similar, uh, but there are some steps that has been expanded. So we have a total of uh, six steps. Um, we add two more steps in terms of uh, understanding the context um, to help uh, differentiate the context where men and women operate within the communities. We also have another step in zooming in and understand women's interests and aspirations. So a total of uh, six steps, uh, the tool provide this uh, very simple step that um, it can be uh, adapted into the project cycle. Uh, the step also include uh, checklists and tools, and um, we also um, went into uh, adapting the mobile apps that uh, it could provide real-time data for when uh, a company uh, use it uh, in their assessment process. Um, some of the benefits that we see is that uh, gender impact assessment is uh, really a, a good tool that can open up the space for dialogue. And I think Maria mentioned in, in her part that um, it can also be a step to build trust between communities and, and the company. So uh, in our experience, we have seen that uh, this has been open up space for dialogue between hydropower company, uh, with the government, but also with the affected community themselves. Um, one example that I can think of is um, 
I was uh, attending one uh, workshop with our local partner CSRD in Vietnam and there is a, a workshop where we have a representative from digital communities that uh, have experience uh, using the tools and they were reflecting on their experience and there we also have representative from hydropower company coming in to listen to uh, community views and and also uh, dialogue began more dialogue with the community and as a result of that uh, uh, interaction the company have uh, learned more about the needs of uh, resettle communities they also uh, open to uh, community request which was to uh, propose a company to consider additional resource that can address the livelihood improvement of uh, the designated villages that were covered in, in our exercise. So I think this is really uh, important that uh, it, it can enable such a dialogue to uh, for both sides to uh, understand each other more and be able to address to some of those needs. That's really interesting. I mean, particularly in a context um, where dialogue or, or opening up space can can be a challenge. I can see how a GIA could really um, could unlock some new opportunities that wouldn't have existed beforehand. Um, it, I mean, obviously there's there's opportunities, but I'm sure it was a challenging exercise at the same time. I don't know if having uh, conducted a few of these GIAs, whether there's any lessons learned or or challenges that um, that you'd like to share that we could all benefit from hearing about. Yeah, um, I think uh, practically um, uh, we at Oxfam understand that gender impact assessment uh, should be carried out at the early stage of uh, any development process. So as in uh, the experience that I share, both partner in, in Vietnam and also in Laos uh, uh, piloting these tools in the uh, researchers uh, community. So so to speak, it is uh, the cycle where the project already in operation. So uh, just to uh, reflect on that, and we would see that the best practice would be uh, for company to incorporate this tool um, at the impact assessment stage. Um, also, we, we have seen that uh, where potential impact on um, different members of community, on women, on, on men, uh, could be looked at from the early stage and uh, could inform to uh, planning process. Uh, early planning process, uh, mitigation process, and also subsequent uh, development intervention. Um, Swam and partner uh, have looked at the gender impact uh, on the resettle community, so we kind of look at it um, as we pilot the tool where project already in operation. Uh, the other things that I want to highlight is that uh, uh, who we partner in uh, carrying out this tool is also uh, important. Um, uh, in both country, the nature of the partner is different. As I mentioned that La Women Union is a, a mass organization, a, a government body, so to speak. And in Vietnam, it is a civil society partner. So uh, we consider that through partnership with the government organization, it has a potential whereby the tool can be incorporated into a requirement for impact assessment in the respective countries. And I think it's it just to note that um, uh, what what we consider as a very important is uh, to get private sector uh, buy-in in using the tools. And uh, we see that uh, the tool that we have already provide a very practical step-by-step -step and it's, it's quite uh, uh, easy in terms of uh, mainstreaming it into the impact assessment processes. Great, thanks. I think um, some of those those lessons um, will be familiar to others who are listening in on the webinar. Um, I, I think some of some of what you describe uh, sounds very familiar to me, certainly. Now, um, our work at Oxfam is only one slice of what's going on around the world to integrate the gender analysis into impact assessment. 
And uh, I think the, the impressive turnout on today's webinar is really a testament to that. Uh, before we got online, Bridget uh, at IAIA told me that this session is setting a new record for the most people to register for an IAIA webinar. So there's clearly a, a big appetite out there um, for doing this work. Now we put the, the term crowdsourcing into the title today because at Oxfam we're definitely in learning mode and we want to figure out what good practice looks like by including as many people as possible in this conversation. So we're hoping that at this stage in the webinar we can turn it over uh, to all of you uh, for a lively discussion about how we're working to integrate uh, diversity and inclusion into the processes and outcomes that we're all involved in. So maybe I will turn it over to Bridget and she'll remind us about how we can participate in this crowdsourcing exercise. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ian, and thanks for such a great discussion, Ian, Societa, and Maria. We've already gotten quite a few questions that have come in, so please continue to send your questions. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can enter them in the questions pane that's part of your control panel, and I will read them out to the, uh, the presenters to answer or discuss. You may just have not a question, but just a comment that you wanted to share. Also, um, new to this webinar, if you would like to verbally speak and share an experience or pose a question, you can raise your hand and you'll see a little hand icon with a green up arrow um, and you can click on that and that will raise your hand. That will signal to me that you would like to speak um, and all you have to do at that point, um, I will recognize you with your name so that you know that it's time to speak and I will unmute your microphone for you, again, uh, so that we can get the most participation and please keep your comments as succinct as possible. Um, and ideally, as I mentioned, it'd be great if you had some kind of microphone or at least make sure you don't have a lot of background noise going on back there. So let's go ahead and jump into our questions and discussion segment. And I'm gonna to toss it off with a question that was asked by Marion. Uh, she says, this tool is really helpful for practitioners. Are there similar tools for community members to support understanding the process and potential gender impacts um, and, and to support participation and or framing of impacts? Over to you guys. You may have to unmute your microphones if you had muted them in order to speak again. So the question is about tools for communities to understand gender impact assessment, if I understood correctly from Miriam, you said? Miriam, right? yes. Miriam, yes. Yeah. Um, a great question. Uh, the, there aren't specific tools designed for communities. However, we're finding that while we ha designed this particular um, version of the tool, with it came from a, a company request, as, as I mentioned, we're finding that actually the tool is adaptable for all audiences. And we're, we're even seeing that in some cases, um, uptake by communities or partners that work with local communities is actually higher. So there's interest there um, and there's demand in using this kind of tool and process to do this type of assessment. So I would say that while the, the, the guide that we've developed didn't have community in mind in terms of the primary user, the, the tool in its presentation is is applicable to many audiences and can be used by very many audiences. Great. Um, the next question is a clarification question coming from Gabriella and goes back to that that slide that showed the table, um, the step one, get collect, collecting that baseline information. So she's wondering if how you fill out the table regarding access and control. Is it just a yes, no? Or do you quantify and, and qualify those answers when you fill out that table? Ian, who do you think should field this question? Um, Maria, if you were presenting the table, do you wanna to speak to that? Sure, I'm just trying to get that slide up so I can be as specific as possible. Um, it was the access and control table with different, um, Ian, do you wanna pull that up for us so everyone can see? Great. So um, 
it can be different. These are qualitative fields, so you could also code them differently, of course. But um, you would say um, what kind of access, and you might say when and how. So you might ask those kinds of qualitative um, questions in order to get the most specific and um, and and accurate information as possible. Uh, it could be a matter of yes and no if you're trying to do some some coding so that you can get some some trends coming from the table itself. Great. Okay, um, we do have someone who has raised his hand, uh, Joshua Kessios. Um, I have that. I am trying to unmute you, but you may need to unmute yourself in order to speak. All right. While while we're waiting for Joshua to unmute, uh, let me move on to another question. Um, so. Maria, you had mentioned Bill C-69 and the passing of Canada's Impact Assessment Act. Um, Jessica is wondering if anyone could comment on the Canadian experience of GIA and perhaps highlight a case study where it was done successfully since it's such a new practice in terms of environmental assessment and impact assessment in Canada. Well, as the Canadian on the line from Oxfam, maybe I'll respond to that first. Um, I think the uh, Bill C-69 uh, is such an important uh, piece of legislation because it sets a gender analysis as a requirement in federal impact assessments. Um, this isn't to say that gender analysis wasn't being incorporated um, on occasion um, and on a more ad hoc basis in the past in certain uh, assessments, but there was certainly no standardization and no requirement. Um, the Act came, was, uh, was adopted uh, just a few months ago, and so I think that the, the new impact assessments that will be conducted at the federal level in Canada will be the chance to really pilot and test what good gender analysis integration looks like in impact assessment here in Canada. Uh, I know our impact assessment agency has developed a fact sheet on that, um, which is available on their website on what GBA plus in impact assessment looks like. But the, when the rubber hits the road, we're really gonna have to look at the assessments over the coming months and years to really gauge what good practice looks like in this regard. And I'm hoping that it will be not just uh, up to the impact assessment agency, but the wider community of impact assessment practitioners in Canada and in other places who can kind of figure out what setting the bar looks like uh, in this context. All right. Um, we have a question from Brigitte uh, from the Austrian Development Bank, and she said they're currently working on a stronger integration of gender into their environmental and social screening procedures. And so now she understands that GIA could be either standalone or integrated um, in it. But if it is integrated, how can we check as project sponsors whether GIA has been thoroughly integrated into an ESIA. Are there additional expertise a person conducting an ESIA would need to have? I'll try that one. Um, yes, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think someone with gender analysis experience um, is, is key. Uh, so coming to a you know, the, uh, uh, an SCIA through a strong gender analytical lens is very important with an understanding of the frameworks that have been used in the past and what has worked and what hasn't. Uh, I also think that um, that in terms of understanding whether or not an ESIA has, has done a thorough review, I think that's a really interesting question. And to my knowledge, we haven't developed uh, kind of a compliance procedure or best practice um, in terms of what good GIA looks like. And that's part of what we're trying to do today and through all of our efforts with piloting the, the tool is, is really trying to um, push, push the ideas into practice and establishing what is good GIA and what elements are absolutely minimum requirements and what will push 
GIA to be, you know, into the realm of best practice and upholding rights and as aspiring to all of those um, those potential benefits that we've just described in terms of um, uh, changing, being gender transformative and improving consultation, et cetera. So I, I think this is an ongoing question in terms of uh, the integrated versus standalone and how we can then be sure that an integrated version is going to be comprehensive. Um, I'm of the leaning that uh, to a certain degree, a standalone should be um, should be demonstrated. So gender analysis should be a demonstrated piece and, and show as a kind of a standalone component within um, an ESIA or other impact assessment so that you can see the elements of gender analysis and then the further and then the the the, the more broader assessment would actually demonstrate how it's imp uh, incorporating the findings of that gender analysis as it looks at different um, specific uh, data points and indicators. Great. Um, and Bridget, I, yes, would I you just, like to add? I just want to just have a word uh, on, on this question because I think it is really interesting. Um, insofar in the work of water governance, I think that Oxfam has been consistent in the in being seen as an advocate for gender equality, gender impact assessment. And I think uh, uh, having, having um, someone such as coming from the bank or financier really look into this from a from a very early stage like a screening process is really helpful to echo what is really essential in the in the very early stage of uh, uh, impact assessment so i think it's really helpful to have this as part of the screening process just want to add that in addition to what mary already mentioned Fantastic, thank you for adding that. Uh, Fatuma Hassan, I have that you have your hand raised and I have unmuted you. Uh, was there a question or a comment you wanted to share? Are you there? All right, the hand went down. So we maybe have already answered that question. Um, now, at this point, um, you may recall that when you registered for today's webinar, as Ian mentioned earlier, that you were invited to um, answer a short poll and some questions. So we, they were some really interesting results. And so I wanted to turn it over to Ian right now to share those results with you so that you all can see how everyone responded. Thanks, Bridget. Um, the first multiple choice question that we asked all of you as you were registering is how would you describe your experience of bringing gender into impact assessment? And as you can see from this chart that we've created based on your responses, uh, about, well, just over a third of you in the purple and, and blue wedges uh, responded that you have uh, had positive experiences in incorporating gender, that you do it more and more regularly, or in uh, the minority of cases, that you do it all the time in your impact assessment work, which is uh, interesting to hear. And over a third of you, the orange wedge said that you haven't yet brought gender into impact assessment. And a quarter, the pink wedge at the bottom, said they have uh, found it challenging to do. So just wanted to kind of give you a sense from this uh, audience of what your experience to date has been in uh, bringing gender into this work. The second question we asked was to uh, ask you all to reflect on what is really the, the biggest challenge in doing gender work. And as you can see from this second graph, most people um, actually listed inexperience or a lack of gender expertise as the biggest challenge. Um, this is followed by challenges in the local context, a lack of tools and methods, uh, unclear policy frameworks and standards was also um, a challenge that was cited by numerous people. Um, lower on the list were actually um, some of the challenges of the, what the expectations of a client or a proponent of a particular project um, might hold or the expectations of local stakeholders. Th those weren't seen by uh, many, many people as the biggest challenge in, uh, in this type of gender work. And we also uh, left an open-ended question where if one of your challenges wasn't uh, reflected in the poll, we invited you to fill in the other category and tell us what you thought the biggest challenge was. Uh, some of what we heard uh, were that cultural norms in the local community presented barriers to the full participation by everyone, women in particular. 
Uh, second was that clients who are not convinced that, that gender is an important factor. Uh, a third uh, challenge was that Canada's new impact assessment legislation requires gender analysis, but with few guidelines on how. Uh, another was a lack of financial resources to do it. And uh, the final one in the other category was a lack of good gender disaggregated data. And that's one that was mentioned by a number of you um, in the category of what are the biggest challenges. So um, I thought this was all very interesting to understand what you considered most challenging in this regard. And I'd be interested either in the, the question box or, or even following the webinar to hear from any of you on whether this uh, resonates and, um, and maybe talk about how do we under, overcome some of these challenges. Um, if our crowdsourcing can help in that, it would have served uh, a valuable purpose. Great. While well, we're waiting for some people to chime in on that, uh, Melissa Simic has a question. Melissa, I have unmuted you. Um, did you want to go ahead and pose your question or your comment? Are you there, Melissa? Okay. Well, let me ask um, one more question. Um, that's all we have time for, and there are so many questions. So I really appreciate all of the great participation that you've had. Um, how would you um, address this in terms of uh, uh, what are the challenges, the biggest challenges in engaging with non-binary gender groups? Which one of you would like to? handle that one. Don't forget to unmute your microphone. Uh, Maria or Ian? Sure, sure. I'll jump in. Um, what are the biggest challenges? I, I think all of this work is, is very challenging. Uh, working on gender in any context is very challenging. Um, there are, of course, um, there's traditional knowledge, uh, culture. Um, there are a lot of local factors and context to take into consideration. Um, particular challenges in terms of gender diverse communities, I think, could be that um, in the the approach and the participatory methodology that you use in any of these methodologies, you have to be very aware, as I mentioned earlier, about the potential risks to folks and. Um, in terms of gender, it's all about making the invisible visible. And this can be very, this can bring up very difficult conversations. It can be um, uh, very confrontational. Uh, there, it has to be an, a nuanced approach and a, a very, there needs to be a very clear sense of risks to individuals and to groups. And I think that in terms of uh, working with gender non-conforming, um, bi non-binary binary folks, this is, even more so, and this is one of the intersectional pieces that a gender lens brings, which is really understanding those various layers of potential marginalization, discrimination, power differentials, and exclusion. Um, it's something that um, very, there are some techniques for um, engaging communities in, in more in safer ways, um, but I think there's no one size fits all in terms of doing gender analysis. I think we can strive to, to establish principles and best practices uh, with a very clear understanding of the dangers and potential risks that this kind of process could raise. All right, Ian, I'll turn it back over to you before we wrap up. Great, thanks, Bridget. I, I just wanted to, um, before we close, to uh, extend a big thank you to the IAIA and, and to you, Bridget, for hosting today's session. Um, I think uh, together we've pulled together an impressive uh, group of people who want to join this conversation and really want to move um, to how do we turn all of this good work into action uh, on the ground. So um, I really look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you, and please don't hesitate to reach out to, to Oxfam, to any of us uh, involved in the webinar today, if you have further questions or comments you'd like to share, either on the tools and experiences uh, of Oxfam that we shared, or, or to bring uh, forward your own experience in this work. So thanks. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Maria, Sochieta, and Ian, once again, for a fantastic presentation. There were so many questions that we just couldn't get to in our limited time, but we thank you so much for um, bringing this if issue forward to our membership and beyond. And it was a, a great discussion and lots of good questions. Uh, to the participants, when you leave this webinar, you will be greeted with a very brief survey, and I ask that you take just a few minutes to fill that out. It really does help us to improve uh, our offerings in terms of webinars, but we also ask if there's topics that you are interested in that we could help uh, find information and bring that to you in webinar form or, or maybe other publications. So please take a few moments to fill that out. In a day or two, you're going to receive a link to, re to the recording and the slides. And of course, those slides will include this resources slide. There's actually two of them. Uh, Oxfam has kindly provided a list of their free online resources that, is a, that are available on their website. So when you get those, the link to the slides, you will get those resources as well. If you have any questions or comments, as Ian mentioned, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or myself using the emails that you see on the slide there. And finally, thank you so much to you all for participating. We know your time is valuable, and we hope this webinar was valuable to you as well. See you next time.